Tonight, the deadly tropical storm striking as we come on the air. Isa A is racing up the northeast after making landfall as a hurricane. A state of emergency in New Jersey and in New York City, a person killed by a falling tree. In the south, a tornado outbreak, at least two killed. Al Roker has the new track. Scenes of horror in Lebanon, the massive explosion, a mushroom cloud rising over Beirut and the shockwave for miles. Dozens killed and thousands more injured. Concerns tonight about what's in the year and pleas for international help. And the question tonight, what caused it? Inside the ICU at an American hospital hit hard by coronavirus, the alarming surge in the Midwest and yet more big parties and gatherings, people flouting COVID restrictions. President Trump under fire after saying the massive COVID death toll in the U.S. is quote, is what it is. New fallout from a stunning interview. The growing outrage, a black family detained at gunpoint, children handcuffed on the ground. Police now say it was a mix-up. The images from reopened schools in Georgia. Students huddled together for a photo with no masks. And mail-in ballots still uncounted six weeks later. Is it a warning for November? This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. It didn't stay a hurricane for very long, but it's still delivering a powerful punch tonight. Now, tropical storm Isa E is leaving millions without power, barreling its way up from North Carolina into the Northeast. At least four people have been killed, trees and power lines toppled from ferocious winds, even tornadoes, the trail of damage and flooding winding through some of the biggest cities on the East Coast. Gabe Gutierrez is in the storm zone. Tonight, tropical storm Isaias is drenching the northeast, racing up the coast. Darn tornado right outside my window. This likely tornado tore through New Jersey. It was crazy. See it forming right in front of you. It's like, what? Powerful winds lashing the Jersey Shore eight years after Superstorm Sandy. The wind's pretty intense coming at your back, and then um, sand started blowing and kind of hitting you in the face. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! And toppling trees across the region, knocking out power. The tree is actually up from the, out of the sidewalk, and it came down on this house. In Pennsylvania, another possible tornado ripped the roof off this daycare with children inside. We hide in the closet because it because it, it was destroyed. The fast-moving system crashed ashore overnight in North Carolina as a Category 1 hurricane, packing sustained winds of 85 miles an hour. Some homes went up in flames. Firefighters waded through chest-deep water. We had families wandering up and down the street holding babies. Not no, knowing where to go. Nowhere to go. Multiple reported tornadoes left a trail of destruction. At least two people were killed at this mobile home park in eastern North Carolina. One minute you're fine, the next minute it's, it's all, all hell break loose. In South Carolina, a relentless storm surge sliced through this pier. The roads and homes flooded. And in New York City, under a rare tornado watch this afternoon, a tree fell, killing a man in a parked car. This building partially collapsed. It just collapsed out of nowhere, and the next thing I know, I just heard like a boom, like everything just fell down. Incredibly, no one was injured here. What surprised many people was just how quickly this storm swept through. Tonight, more than two million people across the Northeast are without power. Lester. All right, Gabe, a rough going for a lot of Americans tonight. Let's get right to Al Roker. Al, this storm is moving very fast. Where is it headed right now? And Lester, it is going like a rocket sled on rails on its way to Canada. Right now, it is moving. I mean, this is really unbelievable. North, northeast at about 40 miles per hour with 65 mile per hour winds. It's already in upstate New York. It's also, as it leaves, leaving some severe thunderstorms and tornado watches up as it rockets into Canada by late tonight, early tomorrow morning. The winds will still be howling for the next several hours. We look at wind gusts that will be somewhere right around tropical force strength. Lester. All right, Al Roker, thank you. Now to that massive explosion that's killed dozens of people and injured thousands more in Lebanon. This blast rocking Beirut and sending a mushroom cloud into the sky like a scene out of a science fiction film. Bill Neely has late details. Extraordinary images tonight of deadly explosions felt by millions in Lebanon. Blasts that shook a city and injured thousands. 
This was the first, coming just after six in the evening at Beirut's main port, sending up a plume of thick smoke. Beneath it, fires raging and flashes of light filmed by nearby residents. None of them could have guessed what would happen next. A second massive explosion that some described as like an earthquake. A mushroom cloud of debris and seawater blasted into the air. The detonation was heard 200 miles away in at least two other countries. I saw something flash and I couldn't hear anymore. It was raining glass all over the city of Beirut. On the ground, dozens lay dead. Lebanon's health minister says almost 3,000 people have been injured. The port area destroyed. But what caused it? Officials tonight say a warehouse has for years been filled with dangerous explosive chemicals. Warnings about the dangers, they say, ignored. Beirut, so often a battleground in war, resembling a war zone tonight. This is a national disaster for Lebanon. Tomorrow a day of national mourning and of many questions. If this was a warehouse for dangerous chemicals, were the explosions accidental or sabotage? Lester? All right, Bill Neely tonight. Thank you. And just moments ago, President Trump strongly suggested that the Beirut explosion was no accident. Jeff Bennett is at the White House with late details. President Trump tonight describing the massive explosion in Beirut as an attack. And I've met with some of our great generals, and they just seem to feel that it was. This was not a, uh, some kind of a uh, manufacturing uh, explosion type of event. It was a bomb of some kind. His comments coming during a press briefing on the coronavirus response. The president touting his administration's handling of the pandemic during a wide-ranging interview with Axios reporter Jonathan Swan. I think it's under control. I'll tell you what. How? A thousand Americans are dying a day. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. But that doesn't mean we aren't doing everything we can. It's under control as much as you can control it. This is a horrible plague that beset us. The president sorting through pages of charts when pressed on the country's coronavirus death count. Right here... The United States is lowest in numerous categories. Uh, we're lower than the world. Lower than we're the lower world? lower than what is that? Europe. In what? Look. In what? Take a look. Right here. Here's case death. Oh, you're doing death as a proportion of cases. I'm talking about death as a proportion of population. That's where the U.S. is really bad. Well, well, Much worse than South Korea, Germany, etc. You can't, you can't do that. You have Why to can't I do that? Have... During the interview, the president was noncommittal when asked about the late civil rights icon, Congressman John Lewis. How do you think history will remember John Lewis? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know John Lewis. Uh, he chose not to come to my uh, uh, inauguration. Uh, he chose, uh, I, I don't, uh, I never met John Lewis, actually, I don't believe. Do you find him impressive? Uh, I can't say one way or the other. And with a focus on the election, President Trump continued his unfounded attacks on voting by mail. There is no way you can go through a mail-in vote without massive cheating. Extensive research shows election fraud in the U.S. is extremely rare. Today, the president, in a reversal, encouraged voters in Florida to vote by mail, saying the state's election system is safe and secure, as Republican leaders worry his attacks on mail-in voting could suppress the GOP vote. And as for the coronavirus relief bill, both sides now say they hope to vote by next week. Lester. Jeff Bennett at the White House, thanks. There's growing concern this evening about the spread of COVID in the Midwest and South. Many states getting hit harder than ever. Here's Miguel Almaguer. Tonight inside hospitals in the South and Midwest, some emergency rooms are now taking on a growing wave of COVID patients as officials brace for a tsunami of new infections. Mississippi on track to become the number one state for coronavirus cases per capita. Doctors are overwhelmed and morgues are overrun. In Tennessee, July brought a 139% increase in cases. Deaths in South Carolina have risen 86% over the last two weeks. These patients are some of the sickest we've ever seen, um, and they're getting younger and younger. Despite the continual plea for social distancing, scenes like this party near Beverly Hills overnight are still unfolding. 
even sanctioned events like this speedway race in South Dakota drawing large crowds. Doctors say those who flout health mandates are fueling the virus spread, a reason why schools are closed, businesses are shuttered, and lives are being lost. We are running at full speed here. At the L.A. County USC Medical Center, the ICU was pushed to the brink in July. That is a huge toll to take every day, knowing that you're the only person, or maybe the last person who speaks to them. NBC News given exclusive access as the caseload finally stabilized. You've seen some of the criticism about what some people call a pandemic, or that the, simply the virus doesn't kill people, it's not real. What's your response to that? Come into my ICU. Come watch. Patients and families are being crushed. What we're seeing is the working poor getting wiped out. We're really asking for the public's help. Please help us keep the situation under control so we don't run out of hospital beds. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. This is Tom Costello. The NIH and drug maker Eli Lilly are tonight looking for 2,000 volunteers for antibody drug trials to treat patients suffering through the ravages of COVID. One trial involves patients who are hospitalized. The other involves those who are sick at home. We believe a treatment like this has the potential to stop that progression in terms of symptoms and to keep people at home and out of the hospital. The antibodies come from a COVID-19 survivor. They target and lock onto the virus, preventing it from spreading. The hope? It could bring relief to people like Ty Godwin in Denver. So it's... Uh... 2.40 in the morning. Ty and I have been close friends since we were kids. A triathlete, Ty's fever has topped 100 degrees for 72 days now. At night, his legs constantly twitch. Yeah, it just feels like my whole body's got flu. My arms tingle, my legs tingle right now, but everything's hot. His only relief, a bathtub of cold water at 3 a.m. My feet were on fire. My chest is on fire. Ty counts himself among a group of COVID patients called long haulers who suffer through the symptoms for months. One Facebook group has 87,000 members. An antibody treatment could boost the body's defenses. Your own immune system is a, an amazing uh, biotechnology factory, and it is able to sense uh, some invading virus or bacterium and make antibodies. Back in Denver, Ty, who's also an artist, has drawn a rendering of the COVID monster that comes to haunt him every night. With multiple antibody drugs now on fast track and reporting encouraging results, it's likely they will be available before a vaccine is approved, possibly within months. Lester? All right, Tom Costello tonight, thanks. In 60 seconds, children handcuffed by officers with guns drawn and what authorities now say turned out to be a mix-up. Police in Colorado are apologizing for detaining a black family at gunpoint in what they're now calling a mix-up. Here's Joe Fryer. The viral video recorded by a witness shows four children crying face down on the pavement, two of them in handcuffs being detained by police. The youngest is six years old. I don't give a damn when nobody say that's police. Brittany Gilliam says she took her daughter, sister, and nieces out to a nail salon Sunday morning when officers with the Aurora, Colorado Police Department arrived. And next thing I know, the police pull up silently behind them and had guns drawn on the children. Police say they were responding to reports of a stolen vehicle, but soon discovered it was not the family's blue SUV that was reported missing. Rather, it was a motorcycle with the same license plate number from a different state. Perhaps adding to the confusion, police say Gilliam's SUV had been reported stolen earlier this year. Like he's like something about the car being reported stolen. I was like, this happened months ago. You guys cleared it. The family was released and is calling for change. It's like they don't care. Who am I going to call when my life is in danger? Aurora police say when contacting a suspected stolen car, they're trained to do a high-risk stop with weapons drawn and occupants on the ground. But the city's new police chief now wants to explore new practices, saying we must allow our officers to have discretion to deviate from this process when different scenarios present themselves. I'm really deeply troubled about what those children went through, and I, I hope that the family will allow me to, to do what I can to make it right. The department is already under scrutiny for its treatment of black people following the 2019 death of Elijah McClain, which is under investigation. I want my phone! 
Now, Aurora PD is apologizing for what happened Sunday to this family, saying it's investigating and offering therapy to the traumatized kids. Joe Fryer, NBC News. The school year already off to a rocky start in some places as districts debate how and if students can return. Here's Kate Snow. On the first day of school Monday in Woodstock, Georgia, students posed for this photo, not a mask in sight. An hour and a half east in the state's largest school district, 260 school employees have already tested positive or been asked to quarantine after being exposed to coronavirus, with in-person learning set to start later this month. It's the kind of news that has parents in Columbia, Missouri, protesting tonight. Right now, we just feel like it's too much of a gamble. Across the country, teachers are joining that chorus. I'm very anxious. Lucy Wilson teaches first grade in Columbia, South Carolina. We first met the single mom last year, working a second job in a factory to pay the bills. Her district plans to bring students back in stages. Do you think it's a matter of if coronavirus hits the school or when? I think it's an effect of when it's going to hit the school because it is spreading like wildfires. The president of the nation's largest teachers union says teachers will have to make tough choices about teaching in person. There are options. When someone says, um, oh, well, you don't have any choices because the superintendent says you have to or your governor says you have to or the president of the United States says you have to go into an unsafe building. No, we don't. While many parents are eager to put their kids back on a school bus. It's going to be a good day. In districts like Dallas, precautions include taking students' temperatures, providing three masks and a face shield for each student, and plexiglass dividers between desks. Still, they're planning what they'll do if coronavirus hits. The minute we know that there is an illness, we will remove the students from that classroom and disinfect and clean. The head of the district said today, with infections still rising in Texas, it looks highly doubtful they'll be able to open for any in-person instruction by September. Kate Snow, NBC News. Up next for us, could election night actually be election week? We are just about 90 days until the election where we could see an unprecedented number of mail-in ballots and questions about whether election night could turn into election week. With more, here's Cynthia McFadden. Tonight, six weeks after the New York Democratic primary, congressional candidate Suraj Patel doesn't know if he won or lost because election officials have yet to announce a winner. It was just a complete mess of a system. The reason? 10 times more New Yorkers, a whopping 1.8 million, requested absentee ballots than did four years ago. Experts tell NBC News New York election officials were woefully unprepared. Governor Andrew Cuomo had tried to make the process easier by sending postage-paid envelopes with all requested ballots. But that ended up backfiring because, to be counted, ballots need to be postmarked with a date something the post office doesn't usually do for prepaid metered mail. So those ballots, thousands of them, were not counted. You are not entitled to a perfect election in America, but you are entitled to a free and fair one. Patel, who's trailing by 3,700 votes, sued to have more ballots without postmarks counted. Overnight, a judge ruling at least 1,000 disputed ballots must be included. And there were other issues. 33,000 ballots mailed out to voters the day before Election Day, meaning they'd never make it back in time. We have to be able to say we messed it up. New York election officials say they were doing their best under difficult circumstances. But that hasn't stopped President Trump, a critic of mail-in voting, from using the New York election mess to make his point. It's been a total disaster. They have... They're six weeks into it now. They have no clue what's going on. How are you going to do that for an entire nation? So what does this primary fiasco mean for November, when 50 to 80 million Americans are expected to vote by mail? It's a cautionary tale uh, of how states and localities really need to get prepared and work with the Postal Service. Stanford election law professor Nate Persilli says Congress needs to appropriate three to four billion dollars to help states and do it fast. I think we have two weeks uh, to make the critical decisions that are necessary to pull off this election. Two After weeks? That, when it comes to um, buying the necessary equipment, making sure we have enough polling places and poll workers, uh, we have 
really just two weeks to put the basics in place. Professor Purcelli says that if the election is close, don't expect to know the results for at least a week, and that ultimately it may be up to the Supreme Court to decide. All right, right, Cynthia McFadden tonight. Up next, a day at the Zoom. In our latest episode of Nightly News Kids Edition, we'll introduce you to these California girls who turned a school project into a mission to help others. We'll check in with the San Diego Zoo to see how the kangaroos and other animals are doing. And you may even learn a thing about some of these critters. I sure did. Our new episode is streaming now. And that is Nightly News. I'm Lester Holt. Thanks for watching. Please take care of yourself.